keep the priority the priority. My own life has been uh, incredibly impacted by missionaries. Um, I was actually born in Indonesia. My dad was sent out to the Dayak people. They were uh, headhunters at the time in 1961, and I was born four months later. And the legacy that missionaries have left me is unforgettable in terms of their response to crises and how they responded in faith. Many of you know my own dad. Um, by nature, he's actually a pessimist. I don't know if you would know that about them, him. He's changed a lot over the years. But in spite of his rather pessimistic outlook at life, over and over again, I would see him respond in faith. So in spite of his pessimism, he would go ahead and take steps forward because of his belief in God. And that's a life principle, isn't it? It's a biblical principle. Um, one of the earliest memories of my memory uh, was during a, an incredible crisis. Um, in 1965, uh, you know, it was the years of communism and Indonesia was going to be overthrown by the communists. Um, they had infiltrated our area and even into our Christian school among the Dayaks. And they had the, the school children dig our graves, actually. But communism was overthrown. And uh, that never happened, obviously. Yeah, we're here. Um, a few, couple years after that, the, the Chinese were being accused of feeding the communists in the jungle. So the army came in, and basically the, the government put out a decree that, the, that the, chi, the Dayaks were to chase the Chinese out of the jungle. And the result was a Dayak-Chinese war. And we were caught in the middle of that. I was about five years old at that time. Some interesting things, uh, my parents and the other missionary couple, the Geary's, some of you know them, decided to stay. And we were kind of in the middle of that uh, whole war. We had a church, a hospital, a school, and we were housing Chinese as they were fleeing out of the jungle. And if you could get them into town, into, into the town called Singkawang, uh, they would be safe. And so my dad rented trucks, and we were shipping like 350 Chinese a day into town to get them to safety. Uh, but we couldn't get them all out. They, would, they were sleeping in our church, in our school, in, our, in, in the hospital. We had them you know, wall to wall. My dad actually uh, got a Chinese evangelist to come in who could speak the local Chinese dialect. I think it was K or, well, the mixture of K and Hokkien. Uh, and we were seeing literally hundreds of Chinese come to Christ in the midst of this crisis. Uh, Dad was gone most of the time, uh, out trying to convince the army to stop the fighting. And so it was really myself, my older sister, and my mom that were left in the house uh, trying to deal, predominantly my mom trying to deal with all this. The Geary's had to leave because they were operating and on and saving too many Chinese. And uh, so their life was, was being threatened. Um, I, certain things stand out, you know, even though I was little. I can remember when the, the marketplace was attacked and all the Chinese women with babies on their hips came running to our uh, to our place, and they were all being cut down. I can remember the morning we were having breakfast, and a Dayak brought a freshly cut head uh, into our area and was very proud of it. He'd weighed it, and I don't remember what the, how many kilo it was, but just very actually demonic, you know, but you remember those kind of things when you're a kid. Um, I remember when our helper came in and threw herself down on the floor and started screaming hysterically that we're all going to die, and my mom was a very mild-mannered person, and she got really mad at that helper. I'd never seen her so mad. So those things stand out, you know. It's like, wow, mom went ballistic. Um, she slept with an axe under her bed, you know. I mean, that just stands out as a kid, you know, these things. And after a while in this crisis, I kind of began to wonder, what happens if the Dayaks get me, right? I'm just a little kid, but it's like, what happens? And, you know, I didn't process it till later on, but basically what my mom did was she was teaching me 
about the sovereignty of God. And that actual, the faith in God in a crisis is the critical thing. And the way she explained it is for a child, right? But those are the best doctrinal teachings of all, right? She says, if you receive Christ, you know, confess your sins and receive Christ, it's like God places you in his hand. And uh, no matter what happens, he's, he's got you, right? If he keeps his hand closed, the diacs aren't going to get you. But even if he opens his hand, you're going to go be with him and your whole family. Well, that sounded pretty good to me, right? One night, finally, we had to flee, and uh, we fled in the middle of the night, and we were uh, in Singkawang, and I think it was probably, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning. I don't have memory of those kind of things, and uh, I called my mom, and I remember she was upset because I called her at two or three in the morning, but I just wanted to accept Jesus, you know, <laughs> and yeah, she wasn't upset after that. Um, <laughs> You know, that's, that's what that crisis resulted for in my life personally, right? To put my faith and trust in Jesus. And I don't remember this part of it, but my t parents told me later after the whole thing was over and we were sitting down for breakfast that I announced at the breakfast table, God didn't open his hand, did he? You know, that's, it's wonderful to put it in child's terms, isn't it? <laughs> Because that principle of, of trusting in God, no matter what the circumstances, is written really throughout the Bible, isn't it? That problems become opportunities. That problems become opportunities for God to use imperfect people for their perfecting, right? For their life transformation and, and for his glory. And that's the way he operates. The Bible is full of these characters. We can only look at a few uh, this morning. I've already got too many in here. Uh, <laughs> but we'll do it. We'll just go through quick. Uh, one, of our, one of the patriarchs, right? We'll look at a matriarch as well. But one of the patriarchs that stands out is, is Abraham. And it stands out for me because Muslims love the story of Abraham. When they get here uh, and they're looking at God's word, they're not debating about Isaac or Ishmael, they're just blown away by Abraham's faith. It's just so powerful in God's word of, of Abraham's faith and trust in God. And you, you all know the story. That's why we can do these quickly, hopefully. Um, but God basically uh, promises to Abraham uh, an offspring, right? That, that all the nations are going to be blessed through Abraham's offspring. Uh, but he doesn't have any children. And uh, they, they come up with their own plan, right? Not God's plan, plan B. Um, but it's not a child with his wife. And finally, he has a child with his wife. And God asks him to sacrifice his child. And you could smooth over this any way you want. But in those days, child sacrifice was not an uncommon thing. And I, we don't know what was going through Abraham's mind. I, it must have been that he believed that God was still going to provide a way. Really, there can't be any other solution, right? And that's basically what he answers as he's going up the mountain and his son is saying, hey, where's the sacrifice? You know, it's dawning on him, right? I mean, he knows. He knows the practices of the day. And this is what Abraham answers in 22.7. And, and you just see the faith just in this answer. He says, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. And sure enough, God provides the way. You see this in Jesus and his ministry over and over again. We, in our prayer time this morning, uh, we were praying according to problems as opportunities, and somebody brought up uh, the woman at the well. And the woman at the well had a problem, didn't she? She had five too many problems. Um, and Jesus told her about them, right? And then Jesus also told her about the living water. And she's, she's getting to thinking, man, you know, could this be the promised one? Could this be the Messiah? I want that living water. But she had another problem, right? The last problem that she held up was, you know, your people, well, they worship in Jerusalem, and my people, my people we worship on the mountaintop, and, you know, maybe this isn't going to work, Jesus, because you know, we're not together on this. And Jesus says, you know, the time is coming and has come where it's not about Jerusalem or the mountaintop, but that you worship in spirit and in truth. I remember telling this to 
one of my first Muslim disciples, or actually having him read the passage and asking him, where do you need to worship? And he said, well, I've been learning since I've been learning this, uh, that what's important to God is that God sees the heart, right? I mean, that's huge for a Muslim. You know, it's all about the external, but he was learning that God sees the heart. And he says, you know, it's not where I worship, he says, but it's how I worship. That's what's important. Well, can you do that in your home? Well, yeah, that's what we're already doing that. We're already doing that, you know, and we do it daily, right? And, and would you go to the mosque? Well, maybe only on the holidays, but it would be to tell my friends about Jesus. I mean, he, he got it, right? He understood it. Um, so Jesus is ministering to this woman. She is, you know, believing that he is the Messiah. She runs to her village. She tells them about Jesus. Jesus goes in their midst incarnate among them, right? Uh, for a few days, he's with them. And then they say to the woman, for we, uh, this is in John 4, 42, for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Really, God uses the problem that the woman has, the crisis is in this woman's life, for her own transformation and for his glory, that the whole village came to know him, right? And they came to know that he was the Messiah. Well, there's a lot more, but I particularly like uh, the story of Esther. Um, I think retreat before last, we did Esther, right, with Amplify group, and that was fun. Uh, a few of us, Justin, myself, and, and uh, well, the leaders took different parts of Esther. Um, I'm looking particularly at Esther 4, uh, going on this context that hopefully we have. Uh, basically, Mordecai uh, found out um, that there was a plot <laughs> uh, under, underway uh, to do away with the Jews, Right? And the annihilation of the Jews. It was a crisis. It was a big problem. And uh, in Esther chapter 4, uh, verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, there being the Jews, right? Because we're not reading the whole passage. That he might show to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. Esther is being asked to do something that's against the law. Pretty, uh, pretty interesting, right, <laughs> in today's times. Um, and that's what her initial response is in verse 11. She says, uh, all the, all the king's servants and all the people of the king's uh, province know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death. That was the law of the land, right? There was one clause, though. There was one exception, except that one to whom the king, the king holds out the golden scepter so that he he may live. So Esther's being asked to do something that's against the law of the land on behalf of her people. And the one law says that you die if you go before the king without being summoned. And there's just this one little clause that could possibly save her life. Mordecai's response to Esther is packed. I, I think the heart of the book really is, is in verse uh, 13 and 14, and, and think about it in, in light of today's uh, problems as we look at these verses. Uh, Mordecai says, Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. <laughs> Aren't those amazing words? Amazing. He's just basically saying, Esther, 
If you don't do something, you're going to miss out. And you're not even going to be safe. You're not going to be safe anyways. Right? That's what he's saying. You're going to die if you don't do something. And you're going to miss out because if you don't do it, God's going to find somebody else to do it. And maybe, maybe this is your moment. Maybe this is your moment to shine. Maybe this is your moment to glorify God, whether you live or die. So Esther then responds. It's a good thing to do here, what Esther's doing. You know, she's, she wants to do a little listening prayer before she does this. And she says, uh, go and gather all the Jews. This is verse 16. Go and gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. And do not eat or drink for three days, nights. Interesting, huh? Uh, or days. I, I and my young woman, women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king. Though it is against the law, if I perish, I perish. She's resolved, isn't she? She's resolved. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. And I'm going to do this thing. And the outcome is in the Lord's hands. Problems are opportunities when it comes to God. They're opportunities for growth. They're opportunities to exercise our faith. They're opportunities to see God glorified. We were sitting around the dining room table of the Catrulls, and Camilla asked me, she said, what did God do in your life when you knew you had melanoma? So both of us had had melanoma now some years ago before there were treatments, and it was particularly, I mean, we were talking about this uh, in light of praying for and being concerned over Julie Green and the fact that we'd all come down with that near the same time. And uh, I remember very clearly, um, it was a doctor friend, actually, who took care of me. He used to work in Kalimantan, so that was kind of fun. He just had me sit on the desk and said, oh, I'll cut that out for you, you know. And uh, I got to watch while he did that. But then he was very, very uh, concerned, and he said, well, we need to get this tested. I'd gone up to a uh, pastor's meeting in San Jose. I met with three pastors, um, missions pastor at Twin Lakes and some others and at the time we were wanting to support church planters and I thought it was a great thing you know I mean we could and it was I mean if God used it at that time but you know we could support a church planter for a hundred two hundred dollars after he got the church planted he would be self-supporting and I was at this lunch and uh, another uh, missions pastor had brought his dad and his dad was at the lunch and he was just not, he's like that's too expensive you know doesn't cost anything to plant a church. Like, oh, man. <laughs> yeah. What planet are you from, right? And the, 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 the lunch was a disaster, you know? It was, it was a disaster. And then I come home, and Leilani meets me at the airport, and she says, you know, Mel, Dr. Mel said you've had this a long time, and it's deep, and if it's spread, he's saying maybe weeks, right, that you have. And I remember working through that in prayer with Leilani, and the sense that I had at that time was God wanted me to say, I'm okay with your will, whether you heal me or not. And I didn't know if I really wanted to do that. You know, it didn't take long. It wasn't this long, long struggle. But it was just like, you know, do, do we believe what we believe? <laughs> Am I okay with, with accepting God's will if it's not my will? I mean, those are incredibly wonderful testing times in our life. And, and honestly, as I look back on that now, it was really a preparation because when we see movements among Muslims in resistant places and resistant unreached people groups, when, there are two foundational things for movement. One of them is prayer. And the other one is when there is a disciple of Jesus from that unreached people group that's willing to follow Jesus no matter what the cost those are the kinds of people that God uses for his kingdom movement, that God uses to build his church. And if we're going to ask others to follow Jesus no matter what the cost, we need to be there ourselves, right? I mean, that needs to be our, our heart as well. And so these, the, the, you can see how problems, you know, just health issues, the, these type of things, daily problems that, that we face can honestly be deep crises 
where, where our faith is, is being tested. I, I brought up my uh, dad earlier on, right? And my mom actually did come down with blood cancer. And uh, she talked to the doctors, and uh, they thought maybe they could extend her life uh, a few months with chemo. Uh, and I'm not making a statement on whether, you know, you decide one way or the other. There could be re- good reasons for deciding one way or the other. But I'll never forget the words of my dad. He says, because he didn't want to put her through that torture, and, and it didn't really look like it was going to work. And he says, well, I think if we really believe what we believe, it's time to bring mom home and usher her into the kingdom of God. What was he saying? You know, if we really believe what we believe, what he's saying is if we really believe that there's a better place and that she's going to be so much better off, why would we put her through this kind of torture for the next month or two? Let's bring her home and let's worship together and usher her into God's kingdom. That's faith, right? That's faith in the just the regular and the, the ordinary things of life that are really big things for all of us, right? We all face those kind of things. Well, I wanted to lay out a few problems. I got a little bit of a problem because I didn't wear my glasses. I can't see the clock. You guys are all in trouble. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Anyways, I wanted to lay out just a few problems that we faced in the field. Um, missions message, right? And uh, hopefully you can relate to those in your own life. Um, one of our problems that we faced, we, you know, you guys have been in partnership with us throughout the years. And uh, together, to God's glory, right, we planted a lot of churches. And uh, kind of in the heyday of those church plants, we were seeing four or 500 Muslims come to Christ each year, be baptized. Uh, it was pretty neat. And we didn't do that, right? That was in partnership with nationals. And, and it's, it's very humbling to realize that it's through the prayer and the support and, and, and all that you know, the fruit really isn't ours. I mean, it's abiding in Christ that we see that kind of fruit, and it's for his glory, right? And that was neat. But one of my problems or one of my crises was that we weren't reaching the unreached people. We weren't reaching the unengaged. Um, And with our model of church planting, predominantly because we had an attraction model, if anyone ever came to Christ from that unreached or un, uh, an engaged people group, it was always a, kind of an evangelism extraction where, you know, you win the one, you lose the 99. And if a Muslim from an unreached people group with a different language ever came to a, an above-ground church, basically they lost everything. They lost their spouse. They lost their kids. They lost their property. And there was no movement. I think that was the more important thing, that there was no movement among that people group. Acts didn't happen for that unreached people group. Christ wasn't building his church. And, you know, if your heartbeat is to continue to press out uh, to people groups or to nations that don't have any access to the gospel, then you, you want to see that happen, right? I mean, there, there is an end to this task, right? Jesus is coming again. And, and it's some of the scripture that, that, like Matthew 24, 14, is one of the clearest verses of the end times, right? It says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, the, the, the ethnos, the ethne, right? Um, and then the end will come. So when all have heard, when all have had access uh, to the gospel, the end will come. Jesus is coming again. So it's not an issue of, uh, you know, they're more important than people here in Huntington Beach, but as in terms of missions, as a strategic priority, we want to keep pressing out to these nations that don't have access to the gospel. So it's a strategic priority, not an issue of importance, right? I mean, it is important, but we're all important before God. And so as a missionary, that, that was a problem for me. It was like, okay, this is, this is wonderful, and we're seeing a lot of people come to Christ, but we're not reaching these last uh, unreached nations. So that was a bit of a journey, right? And before that, God's goodness to, to go through the experience of, the, of, of cancer. And, uh, and, and, and then uh, you know the story, so I'm not going to repeat that one. Uh, but we started to learn. We started to learn of these movements of uh, multiplication. And honestly, today, uh, if we're not using principles of multiplication, we're losing ground, aren't we? 
and particularly in a place like you know, Asia, where it's two-thirds of the world's population, um, you, you know, uh, population explosion is outpacing uh, growth uh, if we're just using an addition model. Uh, but if we have a model of multiplication, then we can actually outpace uh, population explosion, and we can <laughs> change the percentage, right? And not just the number, but the actual percentage uh, of believers and nations that have a chance uh, to hear. And so we started learning of some of the things that God was doing and understand that these movements were starting to take place in the problem areas. Movements were starting to take place in the most resistant areas. The ones that notoriously had never had movement before or even potentially any believers. And so starting to learn these things, my first tendency was, oh, I'm learning these things, so I'll go teach others, right? I was a seminary professor. Yeah, but God corrected me on that one, and it was like, no, go, go do it yourself first, you know? And then maybe have other people come with you. And so God gave me a neighbor who his wife had cervical cancer, and he had a dream and uh, saw a bright light and heard a whisper in his ear that God was, uh, that, that his wife was going to be okay. And he came to me and he asked the meaning of that dream. And uh, I said, well, I can interpret that dream for you. I don't know that I have that gift, but um, that one's pretty easy, right? We can all figure that one out. And, but this was the big shift. Instead of saying, go to church and get saved, in other words, you know, the above ground church from a different people group, uh, I said, you know, God's calling you and you're, you're going to get saved. You're, you're gonna, if you study God's word, you're going to discover eternal life, forgiveness of sins, but what about your family? What about your neighbors? Right? And, uh, and they know this. And, and, and you know this. I've shared this with you before. But just that idea that, you know, God didn't save Adam without his family. God didn't save Noah without his family. God didn't save Abraham without his family. So what you discover in God's word with me, you're going to help your neighbors and your friends and your family discover the same thing. Because God wants to save you and your whole household. I mean, we see that throughout Acts, right? <laughs> it's always that person of peace coming to Christ and their whole household. So that was a big shift. That was a shift to where we don't actually even use terminology of, 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 of church planting anymore. We use the terminology of gospel planting, right? We're planting the gospel in their oikos, in their their household, and through that discipleship process, we're watching Jesus build the church and multiply his disciples and his churches and his leaders, right? So it's a process of multiplication. Well, there's too many uh, stories in that one, but that was an incredible experience, and you've heard some of those stories, uh, enough so that uh, Leilani and I felt that God was leading us to another area, and uh, we wanted to go to another problem area, right? <laughs> so it was kind of like, well, where is the province that has the least, the most unreached people groups, the most least evangelized people groups? So in a sense, there's, there's even a, an idea here where we, we look for those places, right? We look for the problem areas. Where, where is it that the gospel's never been? Where is it that there's nations where there's no believers, and the most unreached, unengaged province that we could find was uh, southeast Sulawesi. There are now 20. There, we used to say there were 10, but they discovered another 10, as if the job wasn't already hard enough, right? Um, but, God, yeah, I think God's up to the task, right? Uh, we might not be, but God certainly is. Um, and out of those 20, now 10 of them are smaller, but out of those 20, 13 were unengaged, uh, never had a missionary. Uh, so a, a big problem, right? Uh, if you can skip back to the movements today, I, I just want to show that slide real quick. Today, and this, this, this is significant, I know that some of you have seen this before, but today there are over 1,600 movements um, and the interesting part about this is these movements are... A movement would be a thousand baptisms or a hundred church plants, all right? Um, movements, these movements are taking place in the most resistant parts of the world. Um, that's significant. Why is the church growing the fastest where it's the hardest? Iran, is, as far as we know, is the fastest growing church in the world. I talked to a leader of movements during the beginning of COVID, 
and we were, I mean, we were just, we were on a Zoom call together just trying to figure out how to deal with this, you know, in terms of global workers that were experiencing movement. And basically, you know, people in Iran were saying, what's COVID? You know, I mean, we've been on lockdown for years. We got wars. We got, you know, we've had to figure out how to worship and function for years. What, what are you guys talking about? You know, it's just... It was, an, it was a non-issue, because why? Because they had faced problem after problem, and they have had to figure out how to do church daily and how to be the church, right, uh, in, in face of problems, in face of crises. And, and that's an interesting one. Well, I, I do have to pick up the pace, don't I? So let's look, let's look at a few others here. Um, when we moved to this new province, um, you know, you have to figure out how to get in. It's not easy, right? Uh, Pat and Camilla came with us on a vision trip and some other pastors, and we thought, man, how do we even get in here? Well, the only visa we could get was a business visa, right? So ecotourism was the thing that would help us get a visa and help us get people into Muslim homes. you got to get into the Oikos in order to plant the gospel. Well, how do you get into these Muslim homes, right? And so uh, a problem basically resulted in having to, to, to figure out, well, how do we get there and how do we get in? We were living in the city at the time, and, and you know, the city is mixed. It's not an unreached people group. We wanted to live in an unreached people group, and uh, we didn't have a place. And I remember one day, you know, uh, I, I, I just heard, you know, you have not because you ask not, right? And so I said to, my, to the little team we had, I said, well, let's, let's pray and let's ask God. Let's pray and let's fast. And the next morning, I had the sense that, that God was leading us to go ask Habib. Habib was a hodge who had a conservation, clam conservation, and sure enough, he had a piece of property. But we moved on to this property, and they didn't like us there, right? We're followers of Jesus, and they didn't like us being there. In drought season, they cut off our water. When we started our first uh, Discovery Bible studies among the Bajo people, there were known, no known Bajo believers at the time. They reported me to the immigration police. The immigration police came to arrest me. But uh, God had set it up, so I was reading, meeting with the minister of tourism. Well, you can't arrest the guy who was meeting with your minister of tourism, right? So they took all my papers, and they said, well, uh, you know, you come in on Tuesday, and we'll interrogate you. Um, but instead, we went to see the head of immigration, and he looked up our numbers, and he says, wow, you guys are doing good things. You're the only ones bringing guests into this province. And so he calls the head of police, the immigration police, and he says, leave this guy alone. You know, he's doing good stuff. You know, well, you know, the cultural tourism didn't save us. God used that, right? But problems becoming opportunities. When we moved out to this province, to this property, we had no other workers with us. The couple that we had been living with didn't want to live among the Tolaki people. They didn't want to live among an unreached people group. Honestly, I believe they missed out, right? They missed out on the opportunity so we said, hey, what do we do? We don't have anybody to work with. Well, problems are opportunities. We prayed about it, and I said, well, you know, we've been training people all over the country. Why don't you ask, I said to my wife, why don't you ask some of them, they were two girls we had in mind, uh, if, if they'll come and join us, and, and we'll just try to do it together. And, you know, even if we model it badly, they'll, they'll see what we're trying to do, and probably they'll do it better because they're near culture people, Right. And so out of that was formed a missional community. And a missional community has been a huge part of just holding each other accountable and praying for one another and, and encouraging one another in these difficult tasks. I mean, to go out and witness to Muslims every day is not easy. You run down, right? You get discouraged. You want to quit. You just, I mean, you, you probably wouldn't be blown away. But there's just a lot of one of our high-value activities is simply going out among the lost. You probably wouldn't be surprised about how many missionaries just don't spend any time with the lost right? It's a high-value activity, and we need to encourage uh, one another to do it. Uh, when you all came out and visited us, uh, there was a team, uh, Amplify came, and then another team from Chicago, and the village that we had decided to go to fell through. They called us and said, don't come. Well, it's a little problem, but it felt big to me. I mean, you guys came all that way, and now we don't have a village for you to go to, you know? And uh, so that night, I got my leaders together, and I said, let's pray. Let's, we've got to find a place, you know? And we did listening prayer. We practiced listening prayer in our coaching circles, and, and we didn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah. 
I woke up the next morning and I just had a sense from the Lord that, you know, we don't go back to villages that we've already been to because that was what the plan was. We need to press to new villages. Let's just go and show up and see if they take us in. And we did. And that was the first Bajo people that we saw come to Jesus. Five. You know, you, you see those stories where, where Paul's going and he goes through Asia Minor and, and God says, don't preach the gospel. And you're going, what's going on? And then he wants to go to another place and the Holy Spirit says, nope, can't go there. And then a guy has a dream and Macedonia guy and he's waving him over, right? What's that all about? I mean, that's real life, right? I mean, God still does that today in, in directing us. Things started going pretty good. We have, you know, over 100 Discovery Bible studies and then Corona hits. And it wasn't that we didn't want to go out and, 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 and disciple those people. They were afraid and didn't want us to come. So we started pouring into the villages, villagers around us. We, we had four health workers on our team and, and, uh, and, and we decided to act as first responders and help them avoid the coronavirus. And the end result were people were afraid and we got to pray for a lot of people. And our prayer intercessor went out and prayed for one of, the, 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 one of our neighbors, uh, Ibu Sandra. And, and while she was being prayed for, she felt the healing in her body. And she says, I, I, I believe in Jesus. I don't know if he can save me or not, but I'm willing to learn. And so Ibu Rita says, yeah, okay, get your family and your friends together. And what you learn in God's word with me, you're going to help them discover, right? The imam, I think all, all the, the love and the care that we've been pouring into the neighborhood, Ibu Rita, our intercessor, went and changed the wound every day uh, for this diabetic. There's no wound care in Indonesia, right? And the, the wound is rotten, stinky. And every time she changed the room, she could, uh, wound uh, bandages, she couldn't help but read God's word and pray. I mean, she just, she just I thought she was going to get me kicked out like within a week of her arrival. But she is relentless, right, in her uh, prayer and reading God's word in these settings. And this is an imam's wife. A young imam stood up in the mosque and said, you can listen to these people. They're talking about the same Jesus that's in the Al-Quran. When do you get that kind of thing? I mean, that's God's doing, right? I mean, these very neighbors who just wanted to kill us and kick us out now are standing up in the mosque and saying, listen to these people. They're talking about the same Jesus that's in the Al-Quran. Well, I do need to wrap it up, don't I? Pat's getting fidgety down here. <laughs> we want to have communion this morning and uh, reflect, reflect on how problems could be an opportunity. When believers respond in faith, that's where our lives are transformed. And that's where God is glorified. One of the things that the Lord led us to during this COVID time, we were going through Acts together as a missional community, and he, he led us to, repent, to preach repentance. It's a good thing to preach to Muslims. Because when you preach Jesus, they're programmed from little to reject Christ, right? Uh, no, he didn't die. Another was put in his place. But when you preach repentance, they all know they need to repent. Even if they're offended, they know it. One thing about coming to the Lord, Lord's Supper or to communion is part of it is, is repentance, Right? realizing that we are sinners, that we need to make things right with others. But there's another part that we have in Christ that we can't forget. That in repenting, we must receive God's forgiveness. We must receive his grace. Um, I had a, Clyde came out, you know, a lot of you know Clyde, taught us on prayer for about 10 days. He had us do a silent retreat. And my silent retreat, one of the things that God showed me was how much I'm driven by guilt. You know, we all have different motivators, right? Sometimes fear, sometimes guilt, sometimes whatever. But they're not good motivators. And then I thought, well, if I'm not motivated by guilt, then how do I stay motivated, right? Well, obviously, we're supposed to be motivated by love. But how do you figure that one out? How do I love more, right? I mean, these things are hard to figure out, right? Problems are opportunities. Well, part of it is receiving God's forgiveness, right? to understand that I'm forgiven. God's receiving God's grace. Those that are forgiven much, love much. 
So, you know, you, you, you say, okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reduce the motivation of guilt. I want to increase the motivation of love. Then you got to work on love, right? How do I love God more? And how do I love my neighbors? And a big part of it is right here. Just understanding how much Jesus has done for us and his forgiveness and his grace in our life. And so this morning, don't just reflect on the repentance part, but let the grace of God wash over you. Let his forgiveness pour out in your life. Because if you understand more about how much he's forgiven us, we love him more, don't we? Because we, we understand what we've got. Yeah, we're going to do this together.